What comes to mind when I say New Mexico? Do you think of massive swaths of pristine public land, rich history and culture alike, trophy hunting and fishing? I would be willing to guess not. I'm sure you're seeing images of Bugs Bunny taking a wrong turn to Albuquerque, or maybe thinking of desert scrub, adobe architecture, and maybe some spicy chilies, or my favorite, aliens and nuclear bombs. But truth be told, I don't blame you. Before I moved out here, I probably thought the same thing. But now, with almost a full year under my waiting belt here in the land of enchantment, this could not be further from the truth. From the southern border with Mexico, all the way up to colorful Colorado in the north, New Mexico is full of unique fly fishing opportunities that can only be found here. The Gila National Forest, the Rio Grande Gorge, and the San Juan tailwaters are just a few noteworthy attractions that pull anglers towards this southwest gem. And if those names aren't reason enough, New Mexico, much like other western states, they host various fish-related challenges, either a trout slam or a bass slam, something along those lines. These challenges, they're meant to entice out-of-staters and encourage residents to explore this enchanting state. But more importantly, these challenges, they're meant to raise awareness for special fish and the waters they swim in. Because if people aren't aware, they usually don't care. Even though I haven't been here long, I care about these waters and I hope this video inspires you to go out there and explore. This trout journey, it starts south. I'm talking way south, folks. Just a stone's throw from the Mexican-American border sits a massive swath of public land with rich conservation history. The Gila Wilderness was the first designated wilderness area in the United States. Have you ever heard of a fellow by the name of Aldo Leopold? Definitely worth a gander. The National Forest itself is just over 3 million acres of scrub desert, thick forest, and sweeping mountains. The canyons are carved by crystal clear trickles that mold and shape the oblong boulders hiding one of the world's rarest trout. The aptly named Gila Trout is one of only two trout native to New Mexico's waters. And this desert dwelling species, it has been a champion of evolution and is definitely worth further research as far as taxonomy goes, because time and isolation has given them some very interesting survival adaptations. Due to a harsh climate, continental shifts, and constant fires, these fish have been put under an extreme natural pressure. In a place that should not have trout, they have thrived for many, many years. But like most native trout species all throughout the world, the Gila, they have been plagued with issues ever since Manifest Destiny clawed its way to the secluded corner of the desert. Irrigation, introduction of non-native salmonids, impounding rivers, pollution, and overfishing are just a few sharp jabs the Gila trout took right to the chin. The decline of this species is a sad story. Ecological gems like the Gila are relatively fragile and clearly it doesn't take much static to disrupt the balance. But I don't want the first submission to be a sad story because the conservation rally in the last 20 years has been incredible. The resurgence of this endemic species now allows folks like you and me to go explore these isolated canyon streams that are absolutely teeming with Gila gold. This is a remote corner of the world, but its raw beauty is well worth the adventure. This particular Gila was caught many miles up a tiny canyon under the looming haze of regional fires. I can remember watching this fish lift off the bottom of the crystal clear stream and slowly sip my imitation ant. Those, those are the kind of memories that make me want to go back so very soon. The next fish on our list is the aptly named Rio Grande Cutthroat. This is New Mexico's state fish and arguably one of the most beautiful subspecies of cutthroat trout. Now, this southernmost species of cutthroat has been extirpated from over 90% of its native range, and yet 
it still sees pushback from getting federally listed under the Endangered Species Act. Like their Gila cousins, the cutthroat's population has been significantly affected by overfishing, introduction of non-natives, and development projects like dams and irrigation systems. At one point in time, you could find this species dominating watersheds like the Rio Grande, where it gets its namesake, the Pecos, and even the Canadian River. In some cases, you can still find the Rios in these big main sections, but just know they are quite rare and usually the result of stocking efforts from the state. To stack the deck in your favor, you have to search far and wide in the headwater streams for a flash of crimson circling the pool. Again, use the resources New Mexico Fishing Game provides to you to filter out which streams contain the fish you're interested in. Make sure to wear some comfortable hiking boots and be ready to go five rounds with the willows. These streams can be quite cramped and your stealth, it needs to be on point. This particular submission comes from the southernmost population of Rio Grande, all the way down in the Black Range of the Gila. The hike was nothing short of brutal, and I think I'm still pulling thorns out of every crevice of my body. But the harsh nature of this adventure all but melts away when I think of that 10 minute spot and stalk showdown between me and this fish. On top of being a unique population of Rios, this whole watershed should be the poster child for native trout restoration. The New Mexico Fish and Game partnered with U.S. Fish and Wildlife to restore almost 32 miles of this watershed and returned it to the natives. Projects like this are going on all throughout the state with both Gila's and Rio's. So just know your fishing license purchases and tax dollars are going to good causes. Hopefully, efforts like this will gain more awareness and maybe gain more speed because New Mexico has the potential to harbor a trophy cutthroat fishery, the likes of which could rival any other Western state. But with that, our two native trout species are out of the way and it's time to move into the back half of this challenge with the non-native trout species here in New Mexico. In the countrywide conquest of our grandfather's favorite game fish, the deep gorges and box canyons, they weren't spared. Brown trout bring a great deal of attention to watersheds such as the San Juan and the Rio Grande. But in many of the major watersheds, introductions from yesteryear still persist and now maintain a healthy wild fishery. You can find these fish as far south as the Gila and all the way up through the Colorado border in the north. In an attempt to remain authentic, I'm going to do my best to avoid the easy trope of comparing these European invaders to the European invaders that brought them. Brown trout are not native to North America. Various strains were brought over from continental Europe and released into these waters. New Mexico Fish and Game claims these browns hail from Germany, but with the dizzying number of subspecies of our beloved Salmotruta, it is almost impossible to say. To simply say brown trout is like saying cutthroat trout. It could be a West Slope, it could be a Greenback, hell, it could be a Rio Grande. Brown trout from Scandinavia, the Mediterranean, and the British Isles are all different, but I digress. The damage to the native fish of New Mexico cannot be denied. Just looking at the native Salmonid species, the Gila and the Rio Grande cutthroat, they get outcompeted by the browns. This doesn't even begin to factor in the dace, darter, sucker, and chub populations that have also been impacted by this aggressive game fish. Now, it is most certainly not their fault that they are here. They didn't ask to be thrown into these wild desert waters, but they are here and in many of the major watersheds, they thrive. In my uneducated opinion, the damage is done and I think they might be here to stay. With all that said, this particular submission is from a prickly box canyon that a wily coyote wouldn't dare scamper into. The staircase nature of this claustrophobic hike makes for some precarious maneuvering, and the creek itself is the perfect underwater parallel to what you see all around you. The pools are infinitely deep, and at times making your way up and over to the next one seems insurmountable. I must imagine a lot of the trout residents are born, live, and die in the same pool. This old Bucky Brown was proof in the pudding. 
with such big fins and a well-defined kite, you could tell this fish, it was a survivor. I'm sure glad he fancied my fly and I'm sure glad he was there to catch in the first place. Next on our list is a non-native trout that can come in so many different shapes and sizes. When I think of rainbow trout here in New Mexico, I try to separate them into three distinct categories. First and foremost is the pellet fed cement stalker. For many anglers, these finless fish might be your first memories of trout fishing. The state, it has a very active stocking program. A great deal of effort has been put towards building hatcheries rather than focusing on the wild fish stocks. But that might be another story for another time. The hatchery raised rainbow trout are the cannon fodder used to satiate the public's demand for fresh trout. A staggering number of hatchery raised rainbows get thrown into rivers and lakes all throughout New Mexico. And if you wanna find these stalkers, think like a stocking truck. They tend to have a higher density around bridges and campgrounds where a hatchery truck can easily access the river. Their densities are oftentimes dependent on the stocking schedules themselves. So if you are interested in getting a limit of trout, be sure to check the New Mexico Fish and Game website for the most recent news. Now there is nothing wrong with stalkers, but when you step away from the easy access and find yourself chasing wild rainbows, it's a whole new ball game. Born and raised in the stream, these fish fight like hell and are infinitely beautiful. Their intact fins and vibrant colors are a dead giveaway of their stream-born lineage. Unlike their stalker relatives, you oftentimes have to go away from the trailhead to find them. Box canyons and the Rio Grande Gorge are where I tend to have my best luck. The third and final category would be the cut bow. The only reason I lump these hybrids in with the rainbow section is because in my experience, they are more bow than they are cut. But because rainbow trout and cutthroat trout are under the same genus, Oncorhynchus, they can successfully reproduce where their populations cross. Identifying them, it can be difficult at times, but the dead giveaway is usually a crimson slash under their gill plate. If you see that, then you are surely dealing with a cut bow. These fish are always wild and can grow just as big and beautiful as their wild rainbow cousins. This particular submission comes from my first real tussle with a wild rainbow trout in the Rio Grande Gorge. You can almost immediately tell what you're working with as soon as you set that hook. This fish, it was hell bent on bending me out, but by some Rift Valley miracle, I was able to get her to the net. Holding this fish was by far one of my more memorable angling experiences here in the state of New Mexico. Out of all the non-natives that thrive in the state, the Eastern Brook Trout is by far the most rare. In the days of research I've poured into figuring out New Mexico's trout waters, the lack of Brook Trout has always puzzled me. And comparing to what I know from states like Idaho and Colorado, most every small stream or lake has a little char lurking in it. And I understand this is a massive generalization, but still, I'm so accustomed to getting into the Alpine and finding these Eastern transplants. So if we're gonna look at this issue in terms of this particular challenge, the lack of brookies certainly makes things difficult for the eager angler. When you filter your search results for brookie streams, there's gonna be a handful of lakes and headwater streams that are gonna pop up. With a few near Taos, a handful around Santa Fe, and a couple in Ruidoso, us anglers, we aren't left with many options. The only silver lining to this dilemma is that usually if you find them, you can catch them. Brookies in New Mexico are gonna act like brookies almost anywhere else. They are voracious predators and will seldom show quarter to even their own kind. Especially in small stream environments, they can't exactly afford to be picky. And so for this particular submission, we're gonna be looking at a tiny stream all the way south in the Lincoln National Forest. For the majority of the hike, the creek was bone dry. This would be a sign for most anglers to just simply turn around and find a better option. But as if on command, water started bubbling out of this tiny creek bed. It was surprising to me how some of these watersheds down there can have miles of dead sections, but still harbor life where water reaches the earth's surface. 
a well-placed leech cast entice a very dark brook to forego its boulder hideout and attack. I can't believe it took me a year, but that beautiful fish was my first New Mexican brookie. Now, with all five trout species caught and captured on film, the challenge is complete. I hope this gives you a better understanding of the trout fishing here in New Mexico and maybe a bit of inspiration to complete the challenge yourself. This is the perfect don't judge a book by its cover scenario because once you dive into these desert waters, you never know what you might find.